Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 152, The Games of Aw Shucks Autumn. Games we are hyped about from the Aw Shucks online convention. With me, as always, the Tabletop Bellhop himself. I am Mo Tuzno, your cardboard concierge. Wow, I missed the Tabletop Bellhop there. I don't know if I've ever screwed that one up. <laughs> Mo tu- no, it is. I said I am Mo Tuzno. That's not there. I don't know where I am. I don't know who I am. I'm that guy who talks about games, knows lots of stuff. People ask us questions, like answering game and game night questions, and I'm trying to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember that whole thing? Tabletop Bellhop, that's me. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. This episode is sponsored by Crowd Games. Check out The Great Machine, or sorry, check out City of the Great Machine on Kickstarter. See, this is just proof that we record this show live and we don't have a pre-recorded intro at the beginning of every episode. So speaking of City of the Great Machine, I actually got to check out a demo of the game during Oshtox. And I have to say, after seeing the game in action and what's going on in that game, I am even more happy to have Crowd as a sponsor. I actually now much more fully endorse this. Instead of them just paying us to advertise it, I'm like, no, I want a copy. This looks awesome. I'll be sharing some info about the game later in the show. So this past weekend, um, I attended an online game convention that I just kind of hinted at, talking about Aw Shucks. Uh, This is the digital version of the yearly Shucks Con called Aw Shucks, which I guess is short for Away Shucks, but really just means Aw Shucks, put on by the awesome folk at Shut Up and Sit Down, fellow tabletop content creators. Now, during the show, I attended a number of game demos and actual plays, and I want to talk about the ones that caught my eye the most. And after that, I've got a detailed review of Roll Camera, a cooperative movie-making board game, and our usual week in review where I've got many, many games to talk about. I think I'm up to 12 at this point. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Let's start off with a number of comments on our Quacks of Quedlinburg review, starting with Chris Groff, who wrote, Excellent review. Took me a while, too, to finally grab a copy, and I'm glad I did. This was an instant hit here. The push-your-luck mechanic feels just right, and as you mentioned, the punishment isn't that painful Mm -hmm. and further mitigated with the catch-up mechanic. It helps keep everyone in the game. Now, Carl Rottenkamp writes, really want to grab a copy of this one. And Caitlin Domey writes, love this game! (laughs) And Jamie Shepard commented, love this game. Both expansions are greats as well. Alchemist adds more than Herb Witches, in my opinion, if you had to choose. Wow, that's a lot of love for Quacks. Definitely a popular game. Uh, we had another comment today on our YouTube review of it. So th- this is definitely one. Whenever I share pictures on Instagram, I get lots of hearts. Um, we are definitely not alone in digging this game. So thanks for the comments, folks. As for the expansions, I'm hoping they're under the tree for Christmas, or if not, here by my birthday i'm probably just gonna have to bite the bullet pick them up i enjoy the game enough that i think it'll be worth it at any cost well next a quick comment on our anachrony infinity unboxing video from keith davies who writes oh man i received mine nine and a half months ago still in shrink i you know what keith don't feel bad uh it's not like we saved up this video and i recorded it months ago because i think i got mine in january as well um i only finally crapped my copy open about two weeks ago and at this point it's open but i still haven't actually put all of my anachrony in the shiny new box yet or played with any of the expansions that is something i should do what i haven't decided is if i should do a reboxing video showing everything going in there if it'd be worth it or not but I don't think it'll fit on my table. I don't think I can fit my anachrony and the infinity mm. box here. So I don't even know if that's possible. So I don't know. At some point, lonely fun. Maybe when Dan is playing uh, on the Switch, I'll sit down and I'll finally sort through everything. I'll be sure to at least take some pictures if I don't uh, stream it in some way. Fair enough. Next, we've got Chris Groff commenting on our best word-based party games article to say paperback is a great game, as is hardback but they don't really fit under the party game Mm -hmm. umbrella. One game I think could straddle the fence into party game category would be Unspeakable Words. Plays up to six, fairly light game, with the insanity mechanic bringing some silliness in as well. Plus, the little Cthulhus are cute. 
They could be. Thanks, Chris. Um, I have two problems with uh, unspeakable words. So the first is the miniatures are not cute because the ones I own started to get a white and greasy film on them that I washed off once and it came back, which seemed to be some kind of something that was seeping out of the plastic. I ended up having to toss that game out. Second to that, though, is I personally don't like the arbitrary scoring system in that game because it's based on the number of angles in the letter, not in the frequency they're used in the English language. And I get it how that fits thematically, but it just doesn't make for a very good scoring system for a word game. And then there's the weird thing where you, when you're on your last Cthulhu, you can spend any word you spell any word you want with any number of letters, as long as you try to pronounce it, and then you got to roll a d20 to see if it drives you insane by using the word. I, that, to me, is a terrible ending thing. I guess it's a catch-up mechanic. I'm not a fan of it, but to be honest, the complaints I'm having about this are thinking of it as a strategy game, of a word game where I'm trying to win. As for a party game, you know what? You can probably be fine with all that stuff. And from what I understand, the 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 gross Cthulhu issue is the first printing Steve Jackson games thing and all future printings were fixed. But yeah, mine went really gross. And that alone was enough to not have me pick up a second copy. Well, I mean, it was a Cthulhu game. Yeah, as I said, very thematic. Like the dice from... Uh... <laughs> yes, I was thinking that myself. It, this was worse than the sticky dice because the sticky dice I was able to clean all right, well, next up, a couple of comments on our Draconis Invasion content. Tommy Brownell writes, Dang it, you're going to sell me on it, Mo. And Cindy Robertson says, It looks like it could be a fun game, but based on the reviews, I think I'll wait until I find used copies. Well, thanks for both those comments. Um, I will say it's solid. Like, it, it is a solid game. The more we played, the more we enjoyed it. Uh, Wrath does add a lot of options, despite that one niggling problem of having to substitute cards, but we covered that in the review and we told you what the sub. But it, Sean has mentioned this every time we talk about Draconis, the base price point is rather high for a card game. So I can totally see at least waiting for a sale or watching the secondary market. Excuse yeah. me, watching the secondary market. Yeah, I'm right there with Cindy. As much as I enjoyed this game, I just felt like the price point was a bit too steep to go rush out and grab my own copy. But well, we're going to finish off with a couple of comments on our sentient unboxing video. First, Thomas Gowan commented, too bad this awesome game is out of print. So this review is kind of too late. And bringing things back around to Chris Groff, he said, I agree that the manual cover is more interesting than the box cover. Yeah, this is another case of us talking about a new to us game that's actually rather old and now out of print. Now, having played the game, more about that later, I do really hope it comes back in print. It's solid. Like this, this deserves to still be out there. And I kind of wonder how it slipped through the cracks because you got a really solid game here. Um, I guess I apologizing for reviewing another out of print game, but you know, it's going to happen again. <laughs> I play the games in my pile of shame. Uh, we aren't all about the new hotness, though. I got to admit today we're going to make up for it. Thank you for the comments. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Now, before we get into our main topic tonight, we want to take a moment to announce our next board game giveaway, which will be live by the time you're listening to this. So to coincide with our featured review tonight, we are going to give away a copy of the retail version of Roll Camera, which is actually sitting right over my shoulder there. This is from the original Kickstarter. Um, it is not the clapper box. It is the other version that was available in the original Kickstarter. So stay tuned until our game room segment tonight to hear all about this cooperative movie making board game. As usual, this contest will run for three weeks and be open to residents of the continental U.S. and Canada. Enter over at tabletopbellhop.com and get bonus entries for all the usual things like sharing the giveaway on social media, signing up for our newsletter, checking out our review, etc. Uh, you can also collect some bonus entries by supporting us on Patreon at the hotel guest level or higher, joining our live podcast recordings on Twitch, and we also like to slip a code into our newsletter for longtime subscribers. Good luck to everyone who enters. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Today, we're going to be talking about some hot new games that we learned about through Aw Shucks, an online board game convention that happened this past weekend. 
So to start, before we get into the games, how about we talk a bit about what Shucks is and who puts on Shucks? Aw Shucks is the digital version of the Shucks game convention that is held annually at the Vancouver Convention Center in Vancouver, BC, here in Canada. That name is short for Away Shucks, and it's a 100% free online convention sponsored by the folks at the Shut Up and Sit Down show. The first Aw Shucks was held October 2020 due to the physical con having to be cancelled that year for obvious reasons. Yep. This year, they decided to do two online cons with Aw Shucks Spring, which we missed, and an Aw Shucks Autumn, which is the con we're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. As for Shut Up and Sit Down, I assume most people watching and listening to us have heard of them, but if not, this is a team of Canadian tabletop gaming content creators that are celebrating their 10th anniversary this year. They released their first video in 2011. <laughs> Since that time, have grown to over 350,000 subscribers wow. and obviously have gotten big enough to have their own game convention. A convention big enough that most of the big name publishers get involved in and attend. Yeah, Shut Up and Sit Down is big. Uh, they are a big uh, name in the industry. They're well known um, and for good reason. They are literally the biggest board game YouTube channel out there. And this may surprise people, but they are quite a bit further along than even the Dice Tower. They have over 100,000 more followers than the Dice Tower does. Um, they have continued, have a big input on the board game industry. Like when you talk about the term influencer, well, they'd be definitely influencers. More people listen to them than anyone else. They, they are, at this point, I would say more influential than the entire Dice Tower team. They have a reach and impact we can only dream of. So now that we know what Aw Shucks is and learned a little bit about the people behind it, how about you share some thoughts on the con itself before we dive into some game yeah. info. So straight up, this was the best organized and most informative and useful online con I've attended. As usual, a lot of the con took place on a Discord channel, which was combined with a web page and live streams of demos and actual plays. They actual gameplay was done through either a mix of Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator, which nowadays is pretty common. Now, the one thing I didn't see were panels. I don't think they were missed. Like, I don't think they, that, that I missed them, and I don't think there were any. I don't think they did it because this is a con about learning and playing games. The Shucks Con itself is a board game playing convention. It's not a trade show. It's not a demo show. It's a get a bunch of gamers together and play games. And that's what this was as well. This was all about the games. Well, personally, panels are some of what I love most about mm -hmm. a con. It's good to see them not overreaching and focusing yeah. instead on what they know best and just doing it right. And I will also point out this was a board game convention very firmly. There was not any role-playing content whatsoever in anything I saw. There were no no d d no Paizo, right? So this was very much a board game convention. Now, while I didn't spend a lot of time on the Discord, it was well-organized, seemed very busy compared to other online cons I've been to and had your usual mix of rooms to play games in, places to get information, places to ask questions, and general chat areas broken up into different categories. Now, the website, which I totally plan to like screen share or at least give you a link, is now just a landing page where you need a password to get in. So I'm not quite sure why they pulled it so quickly, but this was the best virtual convention hall I've seen yet, far surpassing even Origins and Gen Con Online. Now, at the top, there was their Twitch stream, embedded, and embedded well enough you could chat and everything. It was a fully functional Twitch stream, logged you in with your Twitch account, was just as good as being on Twitch. That had their live broadcast going on through the day. Under that were a list of sponsors, and there were a lot. Again, I wish I had count counted them. I'm going to guess like 90. Like, it was a lot. There were a lot of icons there. And then each sponsor, if you clicked on them, you were brought to their virtual con booth. And it was interesting because they were even divided up by halls. So instead of clicking on a sponsor, you could just click hall A and browse by scrolling down. Whereas if you clicked on a sponsor, it jumped right to their booth, whichever hall they're in. Which I still find it odd that they did that for online. Like why even have hall format? But at least people are familiar with that. So the halls were actually tiers um, yes. So they were broken up into, you know, the gold sponsors and the bronze yeah, yeah. sponsors and silver sponsors. So once you clicked on a tier, 
you got, you know, your big advertisement, whatever the company wanted to put there, whatever they wanted to promote, you know, it'd say the company name and whatever their big game that was premiering. Underneath that were videos. Of course, the biggest, most clear video would be the shut up and sit down video for whatever this, this sponsor, whatever they're sponsoring. But then there were other videos too. Like you might have multiple shut up and sit down or you'd have the Dice Tower or Rado or uh, Rodney Smith, How to Place. Now it looked like that was it, but then I noticed there's tabs. If you went shop, it brought you to a US online store where you could buy the games. And 99% of these were direct to the actual uh, publisher. There was also, and this is awesome, but it's because of Canadian Con, a Canadian online store. Now, this was a Vancouver local store that shipped all over Canada, and I'm sure it's probably like a sponsor of the, they probably work with the Shucks people all the time, the Shut Up and Sit Down people. But it was just awesome to have a link to a Canadian online store during a virtual game convention. Um, included on these pages were any con deals or promos, which some had, some didn't. It's, I'm sure it was up to the actual publisher. The next one, you could actually click demos, which gave you, and I don't know how they did it, an iframe or whatever, of their Discord, where you could see all their demos and literally log in with your Discord and sign up to do a demo right then on the same page, which I thought was really impressive. Next was an events tab that showed any of the special events going on. So when, what hours they were running demos, if you could watch live streams and anything else that was going on. And then there was also a link to the sponsor's personal web page and a couple other things mixed in here and there. Compared to the weird floating mesh of graphics that was the Gen Con thing two years ago, or the completely non-existent coupon book, because I think all they had this year at Gen Con, or the origin, like this was so much better. Like it actually kind of felt like walking a vendor hall. Like I was literally browsing. I was scrolling through and looking for, for logos I recognize and clicking to see what they offer. And be like, oh, I don't recognize this logo. What do these people have? Like I actually kind of felt like I was walking a vendor hall. Yeah, and honestly, it's really not hard to beat what these <laughs> other cons have done. Um, specifically in the, the vendor area. Yeah. They have tried various things and failed miserably in managing the hall portion of mm -hmm. these cons. Whereas for some reason, Chuck's the good old Canadian guys just knocked it out of the yeah. park. And from what I understand, it was like, Matt did it like, like, like the Matt's the producer. He's one of the two main hosts on Chuck's. He does all of their graphics. I think he set all this up and I'm like, okay, Matt did a better job than whoever gamma put in charge of, origins online and whoever en world put like oh, i was blown away like like every con should use this format like go give the shucks guys money yep. to host your virtual hall it was amazing the only disadvantage was it wasn't obvious if you didn't click on any of those sponsors you could have totally missed all of this and i'll admit the first time i looked at that page i thought it was just a page to watch their twitch stream with all their sponsors down below it wasn't until i clicked on one of them i realized this functionality was there but like that's so minor compared to how awesome it was. Now, the main place I spent my time on through the entire con was on Twitch, watching the various streams while I worked. Now, I will say this didn't go quite as planned for them. Um, while there were scheduled live events, and they were fairly far apart, like sometimes two to four hours apart, and they were fine. They worked great. No hitches, no problems. They were great. In between was supposed to be pre-recorded game demos, and Matt was having a terrible time getting them to work. And this I don't get, like he did so good on other stuff. And I'm like, I know we've run video on our streams. It doesn't seem hard. So I don't, I don't know what the complication was in the background, but it wasn't until midday Saturday that they figured out the problem. And even then the audio was never in sync, which I got to admit, I found really annoying, especially watching a demo and having it. Now it wasn't far enough. There was like a lag, but it was just enough that it was disconcerting. Yeah, sadly, as people who tune in to see us live at the top of each show know, online yeah. production is hard. And it sounds like they were spending so much time prepping this that they just didn't test out that one aspect yeah. of the production in advance well enough. But I'm sure it's one of those, like you use Streamlabs and whatever, you're just like, oh, this is just where I'll import a video. Yep. And, and not test it because like that should be an easy thing to do. <laughs> and it was funny because like you couldn't hear him but he would write notes. He's like, I'm trying. And he would hold it in front of the camera. So like, it's, he obviously had like an overlay going over top of things. There was obviously multiple cameras, but anyway, that was the one disappointment. So, okay. Uh, overall, it was well done. Like very well done. Um, this, this to me is what I want from an online con. 
like in all aspects. I honestly can't think of anything right off the top of my head that I would change to improve, except like the fix or technical difficulties. Maybe make it obvious to click on the click on the links to visit the booth. That's all it needed at the top. Um, this blew away all other online gaming conventions and hey, publishers, Gamma, Gen Con people, whoever, take a look at this. Well, you can't, the website's down. So yeah, there's my complaint. Why, what, now, before the con, you need a password to go in. And I assumed it was some way for people to put their information in before the con launched. But once the con ended, it disappeared and now is. And maybe it's just they don't want to give free advertising to all these people now that the con's done. I don't know why, but I wish I could show it to you. I, I, this is the part that bugs me the most is I'm like, I want to get a hold of, I, I don't know who at Origins, who at Gamma and say, look at this before it goes away. This is the standard that I will now be holding every online convention. All right, well, enough about a con that's already done and over with and may or may not be back next year. Let's get to the games. What is it you learned about with all that streaming? Okay, these are in absolutely no order. Uh, well, they're in order that I saw them. So some of these were actual plays. Some of these were demos. So the demos were interesting because they were pre-production games where they gave the, the Shut Up and Sit Down team copies of the games they were very clear to say, these are not reviews. We are not sharing a how to play. Like, like these were not paid previews. They were, they were just, we were given the game and here's a script we follow to teach it to you kind of thing. So it was, it was, a, sorry, it was a paid, paid a promo, but it wasn't, it wasn't a preview or a review. So that was kind of interesting. So it was basically just there to show it. Now the actual plays involved members of the shut up and sit down team playing games with either the designers or the publishers or both. So that was actually, those were fantastic because you actually got the designers there talking about stuff in that. Now, Pandasaurus was the biggest sponsor of the, ent the entire event. They, they were the big people pushing it. They're actually how I heard about this con was through newsletters from Pandasaurus, not from Shut Up and Sit Down. And the first game I watched was a game of Dinosaur World. So Dinosaur World is, of course, the latest Jurassic Park game from Pandasaurus Games, trying to follow the whole uh the, what do you call it uh the trend of the original right so they went from an island to a world while you have the world version now there was dinosaur island i'm pretty Which, sure panasaurus would be upset if you actually used jurassic park in their <laughs> well, i don't they think they're allowed to they <laughs> didn't but the the shut up and sit down people made that comment a couple times yes it is a jurassic park themed but not licensed game we'll put it that way yeah i and very much based on some of the things from the movies um so I own Dinosaur Island, and I'll admit I was a little disappointed by Dinosaur Island. Like, there's some great parts about it. There's some really neat stuff, but there's some things I didn't love. One of the things I don't like about Dinosaur Island is for how fiddly and long it is, it's really light. Like, it's, it's not a filler, but, like, it's just not that heavy a game. And it's mostly about getting lucky on your rolls for your... Um, your dna to get the right dinosaurs out but like every type of dinosaur at the different sizes are identical they all do the same thing the the various people whereas dinosaur world is way above it is a step above it is higher difficulty it is now a worker placement game the worker placement aspect is really cool so you start off in a simultaneous play phase where everyone's like buying upgrades for their parks this looks like suburbia. Like, it really looks like suburbia. You are buying hexes. You're starting off with your visitor center and building out. Just like in suburbia, you're building down from your top bar. Um, and even some of the mechanics have to do with what things are put next to and how many people have in a park. There's obviously some inspiration here. So you're putting things in your park. Then you get to the turn phase, and here's where it's worker placement. But I thought the worker placement was fascinating. You have your Jeep, and you drive it to different parts of your park. Now, the park is cheap. And they can't afford multiple Jeeps. So there's one Jeep to bring tourists. And it's also the Jeep that brings people to their jobs, which I thought was an amusing thing. So it's a whole thing about getting your workers to the right positions, as well as bringing people to the attractions you want them to see. Um, I, that's about all the detail I want to get into. This looks good. And I just, I feel bad for wanting it because I don't feel I got enough use out of Dinosaur Island but this looks so much better. This looks like a much better game for myself. I think Deanna would like it a lot better. Um, the components are actually even better. It has wooden meeple dinosaurs that actually look like the dinosaurs in the game instead of random plastic dinosaurs that don't actually match the cards. I got to say, Dinosaur World looks sweet. Um, I wish we were going to a con where Pandasaurus was so I could beg for a review copy. 
So interestingly, now this may be a Kickstarter issue. I don't know what's going to happen when when they actually hit first uh, retail printings, but I have seen a number of complaints about mistakes and uh, incorrect iconography and, and some, you know, some some printing and manufacturing issues with mm. earlier, at least Kickstarter versions of this game. That Ouch. being said, it's still rated a 7.8. It's got a That's solid good. medium, just over a medium weight. Uh, it's actually not rated weight wise that much more than Dinosaur Island, okay. uh, but it is a little bit higher. Um, the One of the other com complaints I'm seeing is it's kind of solitar, uh, a couple of rounds of solitaire, solitaire, but then you get one round where you're actually playing with other people and then you're back yeah. to solitaire again. And yeah, so that was it was explained that way too. Yeah. The simultaneous play phase where everyone's doing stuff and then you do turn based and you're each kind of moving your own or it's the other way, right? The simultaneous you're each kind of doing your own thing and then you interact. Yeah. I don't know. It looks it looks pretty cool. I I would love to do a demo of this. I'd love to review this. Hey Pandasaurus, if you're listening. Um, I I just I can't justify spending the money on it because i went all in on dinosaur island and i just feel like i need to get some more use of the game i know sunk cost fallacy happening right there you just heard it live so my next game is is one i i can't say i'm hyped about but i wanted to talk about because it's kind of a big deal and that is machi koro 2 from pandasaurus um one important thing with machi koro 2 is there was a problematic issue with the first game that has been removed so for anyone who is concerned about that, uh, Mr. Honeycutt did not work on Machi Koro 2 whatsoever. Now, of course, it would be kind of based on his work in the previous, but at least he's getting no money out of this. Now, this confused the heck out of me, and which is why I wanted to talk about it, is here I'm watching it, and they have they changed the market. So one of the biggest changes is there's a variable market. But I own Bright Lights Big City, which was the Target exclusive that had a variable market. And, and like we played it. So I don't know, I guess only Bright Lights Big City had a variable market. So the version of Machi Koro I played is the only one that had it. I can't see playing the game without it. So I guess that's a big deal for people who don't have Bright Lights Big City, which again was a Target exclusive. The other thing that's really big in this one, and this I get, is normally in Machi Koro 2, it's all about building uh, monuments or something. Like everyone gets a set of buildings that are unique, they're not unique to them. But like everyone gets the same set of buildings. The game ends once you built them all. And these were all things that, that modify the gameplay, get you extra dice and stuff. Well, now these are unique. You don't all have the same monuments or whatever they're called. So I thought that sounded interesting, but overall, it's still Machi Koro. They didn't, it's still roll one die, add it together. When you unlock a second die, it's roll one or two dice. You choose to either roll one. If you roll two, you have to add them. Eventually you unlock a third die, get lots and lots of money, and then lots of take that stuff that takes the money away from you. Your end goal is to build your five or six monuments. The difference is your monuments are different. Uh, my monuments are different than Sean's. I've got to say, it does sound like a progression from Manchi Koro, but I don't think it's going to win me away from Space Base or Valeria. Fair enough. And Pandasaurus, don't listen to that part now, because I still want you to send Dinosaur World. Oh, fair, fair enough. We can't all love all the games. <laughs> all right, up next is a game called Four Gardens. This one is from Arcane Wonders, and uh, we tend to like games with table presence. This game wins for best table presence of the show. In the center of the table, you build this plastic and cardboard pagoda that I think is four layers that has the whole peaked roof thing going on. Now, the neat part about the pagoda is you can turn sections of it. And on your turn, you get the stuff on the pagoda that's facing you. But you also know what all the others are because it's a blank, a one, a two, and a three. That's all it is. It's a way to track. You probably could have done it with dice, to be honest. But this is a way to do it. And the, the thing is, is it works like lanterns. So it's what, so you have to have, your four players have to be each sitting opposite each other. So you get what faces you on the pagoda, which is the part I don't think you could just do with a set of dice. What you're doing with that stuff is you're using them to build panoramas. And here, the game looks a lot like Takedo, where you are building these vistas of gardens that have multiple parts to them. And you're using the resources, you get off the, pan the, the pagodas to buy cards, and then eventually you put all the resources in your cards, you flip them over and try to build panoramas. Now, this was a very short 
Um, no, sorry, it was an actual play, but I didn't catch all of it. Um, a mix of technical difficulties. In fact, I was working, so I can't really tell you more than that. But I got to say the pagoda looked really neat. And the combination of getting, I, I love lanterns for that whole, I put down a tile and I got to get what I want and make sure you don't get what you need. So it's all about turning the pagoda. So I get the good stuff, but I don't help other players. I love that in lanterns and it looked just as cool in this. And I liked the Zen nature and the artwork. The artwork again, reminded me of Tokaido. The artwork for those panoramas looks amazing. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot of great things to say about this. My initial concern when I first when when Mo first uh, showed this one to me was this tower and the longevity and storage and this. But the more you look into it, they've really taken a step to look and think about not only the storage but mm -hmm. how to reinforce the cardboard to make it last longer, to make it not you know damage itself as you're rotating these pieces. Mm -hmm. They really seem to have done a fantastic job with what could be a very brittle and problematic mm -hmm. centerpiece. Yeah, and the one thing we were able to confirm during the live stream is it just goes back in the box as it is. Like once it's assembled, it gets stored that way, it comes out that way, which sounded awesome. Mm -hmm. Next is City of the Great Machine, which happens to be from our sponsor, Crowd Games. So the thing here is, is the Great Machine is the man it is it is a city a clockwork city with all these gears and it's a dictatorship and the city provides for everyone and it's very much a a dystopia you are playing steampunk revolutionaries trying to fight against this establishment and disrupt the great machine so you have a bunch of districts that are map tiles that are built with six things and the whole thing is the city the machine is floating because you got to get airships in with your steampunk, right? That's kind of a thing ever since Abney Park. You don't have a choice. You just have to. You have to wear brown. You have to have goggles. You have to have airships and gears. So the cool part is you build this map with different districts, and they can be moved around. Now, this is a blind movement game, and it was originally sold to me as a one versus many game, but it's more of a, a DM style role. It's more of the, the Empire in Imperial Assault than Dracula and Fury of Dracula. Because the people who are moving blind are the players, whereas the establishment is the one who doesn't know where they're going and is trying to do things. So everyone has card-based movement where they basically put down a card saying which district they want to move to, and that's it for your hidden movement. Then the machine takes their turn. So then the machine starts moving guards around, and they have these like really cool assassins that move around, and they have the cyborg servants. Sorry, they're cyborg servants, not assassins. And then they move everything. And then the players reveal where they went, right? And then we see what happened and did they get caught and stuff like that. Now the machine, if they get their servants to six different boards can do different things. There's a whole system of getting to the, um, getting to the, the law building and then you can enact new laws. And if the rebels don't disrupt them, they go into play and change it, make things better. Um, one of the other things the servants can do is move the boards around. So if you know the players are trying to get, you know, from here to here, you can then rearrange the whole city. Uh, you can deny access to certain spots. When you get in a fight, instead of your character dying, you just get denied access to the area you were in when you were got caught. So they basically like, change your armband so you can't go there anymore, which limits where you're going to be able to go later. So then the person playing the machine now knows that player, well, has to remember, actually, that player can't go to that spot because they caught him. Um, there's a whole thing with discontent where you're trying to build discontent. It's on a big steampunk looking clock. And that's what the rebels are trying to do. And they start getting discontent and then more and more people of the city start joining you um there's some social commentary where the artists are the first to join your cause and eventually it keeps going and eventually you'll get the nobles to join your cause and if you're able to do it you then defeat the great machine this looks really good like like when i agreed to sponsor for crowd games we don't just accept any sponsorship i always look at the game it looks pretty solid it looks like it looks like something we'll enjoy i had no idea how much i would want this game until seeing this demo yeah, no, this, uh, the game, I don't think the game uh, shows on the table as well. Uh, like just looking through the pictures in the gallery uh, mm -hmm. on Board Game Geek shows you really fully what it's, it's capable of. Uh, I think you really do need to either try the Tabletopia demo or see a live play of it to really get mm -hmm. the full experience of the City of the Great Machine. Next, I've got Tales of the Red Dragon Inn. So this is from Slugfest Games. And honestly, I totally thought this was just another Red Dragon Inn card game expansion because there, there are so many. 
I own something like 14 characters for that game, and I don't even think I own half of them. And I thought it was really weird when um fan of the show Wilt Chamberlain got a hold of me and was like, have you seen the Red Dragon Inn Kickstarter? And I literally said, I'm like, I don't care about Red Dragon Inn. Well, I suck because I should have checked it out because this is a dungeon crawl. So the entire theme of Red Dragon Inn is it's a, a beer and pretzels card game about a group of adventurers who just got back from the dungeon and are splitting up the treasure. And they're trying to drink it away and gamble it away. And you want to be the last person who hasn't passed out or gone broke. Well, this is the beforehand. This is the dungeon crawl. This is go what you did. This is what your characters did before they went to play Red Dragon Inn. The thing is, this looks like Gloomhaven. Like if you look at a map of it, you could swear it's Gloomhaven. It's hex based. There's tiles. There's counters. The monsters even kind of look like Gloomhaven monsters. There's hazardous terrain, all that stuff. But instead of being a heavy Euro thinking game, this is a light, silly game. This is a, you know, move as up to your movement and roll the attack dice and see if you get hits. Now, because it's Red Dragon Inn, you have, of course, all the characters that already existed. So you get to play your favorite characters from the game, including having the wizard with Pookie the bunny, his familiar. Now, it adds in the silliness, both from the type of abilities, but what they have is abilities called shenanigans. Every character has their own set of shenanigans that break the rules in some way. Now, this is one of those games with charred tokens, so you use your shenanigan again, and then it counts down before you can use it again. You're going to roll lots of dice. Um, this is an Ameritrash dungeon crawler, right? This is a hack and slash, chuck the dice, have a drink, have fun. This is even lighter than Descent. Now, at this point, I have no idea when this game's coming. Um, they have been trying to get prototypes for six months and still have not gotten a physical copy. So they made the most impressive tabletop simulator version of a game I've ever seen. Like this is, it looks like 3D, like I'm playing a game. If you are tired of grim, dark dungeon crawling and want something light and fun, I think Red Dragon Inn may be up your alley. Yeah, unfortunately, currently it's listed as 2023 yeah, on board like game. Like I said, they're... We're, we are so about the new hotness. We're two <laughs> years ahead of time on this one. Absolutely. Uh, it definitely does look like interesting. But again, you're, uh, the only thing we're looking at is digital versions. Yeah, so that's all that exists. <laughs> it's it's hard to say for sure. All right. Next, I've got Brian Boru, High King of Ireland. This is from Osprey Games. Osprey used to be a place that wrote military history books and now does board games um, and, and card games. And I have to mention this because it did a mashup that I have never heard of before that sounds really neat. It's a trick-taking card game combined with folk on the map military or area control. This is Irish versus the Vikings. You are playing the Irish. The Vikings are like the AI that comes in and raids. But of course, the Irish don't get along themselves. So you are fighting over territory. You are taking territories on the map, area control style through war, diplomacy, and of course, befitting of the time period, marriage. Um, there are three suits only to the cards, but there is technically a fourth that is a wild suit. What happens is if you put your spot, your token on a tower, that starts a round of trick taking. The color of the tower determines the lead suit. The winner of the trick gets to own that tower. Then the owner of the trick gets to top, keep their card, but then the losers get their cards back. So like the winner who won the trick gets the tower, but then all the losers get whatever cards they played, which each do something. Like one of the cards is get married to someone, another is expand your forces, another is fight back the raiders. Trick taking with dudes on a map, folk on a map, sorry. Trick taking with folk on a map. That alone makes me want to try this game. Yeah, this one, this one's interesting, and I'm in, I'm I'm confused as to who did the entry for Board Game Geek because right now <laughs> the only mechanism listed is trick taking, despite the fact it's very clearly a map board that, that where yes. things are happening. It cannot possibly be just a trick taking game, oh. and yet there it is. So it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens. It is listed as 2021, but let's not believe that, folks, because yeah. this is pandemic times. Your best bet on this one may be going to Osprey's website because I know there was a link to it in that virtual dealer hall where I could find more information on this game. And I did look at some pictures, but yeah, trick taking and folk on a map that alone. I'm like, I like trick taking. I like folk on a map. Be beware though. This is not your regular low cost trick taking game as an Osprey publishing game. The MSRP in Canada is 74.50. <laughs> 
uh, to be honest, what I saw, there's a lot of wooden bits. Again, folk on a map, right? No yeah. minis, but but think of all your tokens and stuff going out on a map board. So there, there are 46 cards, 139 tokens, and 125 yeah. wooden discs in uh, this see, game. That does not sound unreasonable for 70 bucks. Yeah. All right, next up, a, a Verdant from Flat Out Games. Um, artwork by Beth Sobel. So this is the, the woman who did Wingspan uh, and many other games. Fantastic art style and work for doing hyper-realistic artwork. Well, not hyper-realistic, I would say. I wouldn't say hyper-realistic. This is a game that I think is going to be more zen than Takedo. This is all about building your own like um, sunroom. So you are collecting plants, like like perennials and plants that have to go in the sun. You are purchasing chairs and end tables and like a cat. Um, you're basically making your own little greenhouse garden area um, where the plants have to be placed next to something adjacent in your room. Um, the other stuff like comfy chairs and fish tanks go in there. Um, building, you're trying to build the happiest room possible. Now, the objects have symbols on the edge to show how much shade they provide. So you have to make sure you put your shady plants in shade of the whatever the table or the blinds. And you need your full sun plants out in the center of the table where the light from the window comes in. Um, there's this neat mechanic where you can upgrade your pants by adding pots, where it actually gives you a token that you place over top of the card. So it now looks like the plants in a new pot. Um, I have no idea how good this is, but I love the theme. And it just seems so zen. And I love the fact that like you make your room happier by having a cat in it and stuff like that. This one just looks neat. Yeah, no, this one is very interesting. Um, there's bag building and there's a whole tableau uh, thing. And the cards are actually interlocked. The actual four sides of the cards have different light levels mm -hmm. and shade levels. And uh, the little the little fern meeple are, mm -hmm. are cute. Um, it's an interesting. I think that's the number of leaves that have grown on your plant, which shows to be how healthy they are. Yeah, it's it's interesting. There's there's a lot to it. Um, you know, I guess if you're a board gamer and a house plant enthusiast, this yeah. could be your game. Just like all the bird lovers have been uh, yeah. swamped with games that they love. <laughs> Next is cartographers from Thunderworks. So this is a flip and write. This is not new. So I don't, I watched an actual play of this. So what I'm guessing is they probably were playing with some new expansions coming. So I, I don't have a lot to say about this because I don't want to spoil anything that's supposed to be coming soon or I, I don't want to say anything that's not in the base game, right? Like I don't want to go, oh, this was an awesome mechanic and it ends up that's not actually in the base game. This is a game that's already on my wish list. Um, I need Tim to send me a copy of it. I've been talking to him about it. We were supposed to hook up at Origins. Didn't happen. Um, this is a fantasy game from the same group that brought you role player, the game where you roll up characters. It's set in the same universe. They've now started to build this fantasy universe. And what you're doing is making a fantasy realm. Technically, you're mapping the, the kingdom. This is done by flipping over a card that is going to show two up to two different terrain types and up to two different shapes. Usually a big shape that takes lots of room and a small shape. If you draw the small shape, you get some coins. Coins can be used to do stuff. Um, everyone plays off the same card. So I always enjoy games where you do that. You flip over the one card and everyone's got to draw whatever. It'll it'll say something like Valley Stream and it'll show you can draw forest or river and it has to be whatever, you know, Tetris shapes. Right. It, along with this is a scoring that's open right from the beginning where you can see what the scoring is going to be and you're trying to do stuff, right? Like connect up the ruins or have the longest forest or your biggest three by three city area and so on, right? The kind of stuff you expect to score in polyominoes. Um, what I thought was neat in this too, is this was seasonal. Again, hopefully this is in the base game where you play through summer, spring, whatever. Well, you'll throw up a card and it'll say like spring six. Then you'll flip up the actual spring cards and they're numbered one to three. Well, you could pull, pull six ones before spring ends, or you could draw two threes before spring ends. So you never know when the seasons are going to end. This one just looks fantastic. Again, I don't know if they were trying to show off something new coming or if just, you know, Thunderworks sponsored a, a, an actual play. So it what looks I, so good. So what I suspect is uh, in 2021, they released a Kickstarter Cartographer's Heroes Collector's Edition on Kickstarter. Okay, that's probably. And this probably. contained both the cartographers, but also a uh, custom plastic insert, three expansion map packs, and okay. a skill pack mini expansion, uh, as well as some colored pencils. 
So um, that there, that's probably what they're pushing right sense. now was this big collector's edition, which gave you all the content for cartographers okay. in one box. That makes sense. And I do think the maps they were using were not the base game ones, though I don't know. Maybe ruins are on the base game. There are, yeah, there are three, um, three new map packs that came out this okay. year. All right, next I've got Beast. This is from a company called Studio Midhall. This is a huge fantasy realm map. This is a table hog. It's going to take up a lot of room. This seems to be a new theme. I've seen a few games following this where you are playing medieval fantasy. You know, I didn't see any elves, but I definitely saw like barbarian and ranger type characters and a thief type character trying to catch the beast. Now the beast is randomized. So in the actual play I watched was a giant hog called like Hogsmeade or something. Hogbad. Hogbad, thank you. Called Hogbad. And they were trying to catch Hogbad. This is the hidden movement game, the swap around. Like what I usually think, unlike City of the Great Machine, this is why I think of when I hear hidden movement, is a bunch of players trying to catch the one player. So the one player is playing the beast, moving around the board. What they're trying to do is eat farm animals and villagers which are all represented by animeeples and meeples all over the board so the beast going around the map trying to eat people as it eats people it's um i forget the word animosity towards the characters goes up and as the characters attack them and that's how the beast levels up and every time and the same thing with the characters when they fight and lose their animosity goes up and that's a way to unlock new powers um this does a whole hidden movement thing but it's drafting and this sounds awesome. So you have a hidden movement game, right? Where most of them is like right down on a sheet of paper where you go. And then Fury of Dracula improved on that by playing cards face down on a table. So you can always go back and look at where you were. But what this does is drafting. So I get a hand of cards and I have to pick my move and then I pass to one of the other players and they got to pick their move. Well, someone also has to pass to the beast. So you may have an idea of what cards the beast has and where they might go. That sounded fantastic. The people playing this claimed this blew away um, Fury of Dracula. Like, like this set a new standard for hidden movement games. Jeff, Seuss, if you're listening, I think you're really going to want to check this one out. Personally, I'm really curious. This sounds neat to me. And it seems to be the new thing, like b chasing the monster thing. I don't know if it's Monster Hunter, the video game series in popularity, what it is, but these seem to be coming up more often. I guess say the beast looks good. So and now when you're saying looks good, I yeah. don't, you're, you're not really <laughs> like the art on this game mm -hmm. is fantastic. The art is by one of the designers, Aaron Midhall, who is, and I, I assume a, a brother or relative Elon Midhall is the other designer, but uh, I just not only have gone through the images from the game, but I went and found Aaron Midhall's uh, Instagram page. Yep. And as an artist, his style is fantastic. Also got a couple of cute cats, but um but no, I, I have to say the artwork on this game is just captivating. So Ryan in our chat is saying, would rather play games from the monster's perspective? Well, you get to do it in the beast. Yep, you right. can play the beast. There you go. And all movements hidden for Ryan. <laughs> Next, I have Brick and Mortar. This is from Octoraf, not Octograph, Octoraf Games. This is a game about building brick and mortar stores non-online stores, independent businesses. Stores are represented by cards that look like the inside of the store, like you just walked in the door. Each has shelves that hold different goods. You're basically making a strip mall. They didn't call it this, but like your player board has a spot for four stores and you're putting stores in and you are going to rotate them as time goes on. Um, one of the things you have to do is pay for electricity bills, who gets what shops as an auction. Um, you can close down shops. And all shops give you something when they close. So this is another one of those games where um, someone asked this question the other day, games like um, Small World, where you put your things into like retirement, right? You play a thing for so long, then you go into decline. Well, this has that. Eventually, you're going to want to close your shops before people don't care about them anymore. It's basically strip mall landlord the game. Um, bonus points for unique theme. This is definitely an economic game. Um, when you're buying goods, it's a it's a bidding auction to who gets to go shop first. So whoever bids the most gets to buy product first, and then whoever bids second only gets the leftovers. But then they only pay what they bid. So it's it's not like an auction as in someone's going to get all five of these. If there's five and I bid ten, 
I get first pick, but maybe I only want one and I wanted to be sure. Whereas if Sean bid five, he could buy the rest for five each. That's a great way to do it. It simulates supply and demand well. Um, the way selling works is how many you have to sell in the price, but you get to set your own price. Like you literally sit back and Sean decides his goods are three and mine are five. And while people only want six, well, Sean's three go first, and then three of mine. So that's really cool. Um, there is only so much demand every turn. It looks light and silly. Like the art style in this, I thought was going to be a nice quick. It, it reminded me of Foodies, if anyone's played that game, or um, Networks Master is, Chef. Networks is what it reminds me of in some to some degree. Fair. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Now, what the shelves actually do is they show you how good your goods are. So when they're on the top shelf, they're they're fresh, and then when they hit the next shelf, they're not as good, and they can rot if they fall off. Um, one of the things I did. I don't know if I like it. I'd have to play it. That brings me back to Princes of Florence, an old Aaliyah game. Is you would expect an economic game like this. Almost everyone I've ever played is at the end of the game, whoever has the most money wins. That's not the case here. Instead, you can buy points during the game. And then it's, do I buy points or do I save the money to make future investments? And when do I convert my money to points? You can also, if you need the money, sell your points, but it's not at the same value you bought them at. This looks like a significantly heavy economic game with a very approachable theme for a game like that. So, yeah, it's ra it's rating right now. And again, this is still early, but it's rating right now at a 3.17. So it's on the medium, yeah. you know, medium That's scale. Uh, and uh, there are, is also already an expansion for additional stores out. So yeah, Kickstarter uh, stretch goal that was funded. Yeah. So you can get additional stores out there it, it looks interesting i have to say um i'm not a huge auction lover but yeah. it the the theme of this and the way it's integrated and the the number of mechanisms involved makes this look interesting yeah like to me it, it seems like food chain magnet light like very light compared to food chain magnet but still not being simple I know it really caught my eye. Like at first I was like, oh, it's this light game. And then they started teaching it. And I'm like, whoa, okay. <laughs> so they did an actual play. It was an hour long. They got through two turns. Now that did involve the teach. So it just kind of goes to show that this was a heavier one. Next, I have Lizard Wizard from Forbidden Games. This is the follow-up to Raccoon Tycoon. Though it's only similar in the fact that they took a really solid kind of interesting card-based game and put animals in it to make it more appealing. Because Raccoon Tycoon is a solid economic game that they threw in raccoons to make it interesting. Um, this is a card-driven game where you're using auctions to recruit re wizards. Your wizards are going to recruit, get you reagents. You're going to use your wizards and your reagents to build wizard towers. You get bonus points for matching the right types of wizards to the right towers. You're going to collect spells. Um, you're going to cast the spells using your reagent reagents. All of the spells spells are silly this goes with the whole lizard wizard theme and break the rules what you're trying to do is like set collection and other elements think like sushi go like each different type of wizard scores a different way than the other ones great artwork neat theme um they in addition to this there's a, a dungeon crawling aspect where you can push your luck where you send your familiars into the dungeon to find you stuff and you start flipping over cards from a deck and it's like oh i found a gem and then you decide do you keep going or do you flip again and if you find a monster your familiar retreats and you get nothing just cute little mechanic to throw in there um one of the things i thought was fantastic about this game that ian would love or one of our friendly local game store owners is all of the take that cards where you steal stuff from other players or, or hinder them in some way have a star on the card. And if you don't like playing take that, take them out of the game. I love that. Yeah, no, this is, uh, it's interesting. The game, it's, it's a very thematic art style. Mm -hmm. um, not particularly my taste, but it's very well done. Just not, doesn't, uh, doesn't do it for me, but it's a very nice art style. Uh, just, I'm, uh, not, to overall, your taste. not to my taste but no it's I, again yeah. i there's there seems to be a whole lot of this let's take a board game and make it animal style yes that's... right now which is just kind of I, after a while i i kind of i guess i'm kind of burning out on that that Fair. twist on it's not even retheming it's just rearting almost yeah it's, so i don't know I, I i think a lot of people are like it worked for root we got the world to play a coin game <laughs> i think that's part of it and i think ratoon tycoon was like let's see if we can get the world to play a train game right all right i only got two left so sorry if this is taking longer than i thought it would i, I think it's been going well a game called bequest 
This is from WizKids, and this is one I had to put on the list because I think Sean would love it with all of his love of super stuff recently. This is You Are Playing the Minions, splitting up the evil mastermind's loot after he's defeated by the heroes. This is a super short filler, 30 minutes to play, get a hand of cards. You then do the split you choose. So I have five cards. Between me and my player on my right, I have to split those up. So I'm going to say these two go in this pile, these three go in this pile. At the same time, my player on my left is going to do that. Then the player is going to look at those and pick one of the two piles. Oh, I'm going to want the three because there's three of them, or do I take the two because they're really good? And again, you split these cards however you want. And I think it's actually a six-hand card. Or it might be five because I don't think you never split. It's either five or seven. Um, you're going to switch which way you pass. It uses this little splitter board to keep that clear. So one turn you pass this way, the next turn you pass this way. Then at the end of the round, everyone looks at what they got. You put it down in front of you, you play a couple more rounds, then you add up your points. This is very much sushi go scoring, right? You, you get this one's worth sets. This is worth it if you have sequins. This is worth it if you have different types and so on. Yeah, very quirky fun. You get stuff like your cult, there, there's evidence he left behind, treasure, uh, minions, and, and things. It definitely looks like a fun little uh, filler filler game. Yeah. Yeah, to me, this looks like Sushi Go with a neater theme. Yeah. Finally, I have Mythic Mischief. And I don't know if it's IV games or four games. I don't know if they're going for the, the, the Roman numerals or not. Um, this is an asymmetric game that is very much based on your popular kids in a wizarding school. Um, you are playing different factions, different houses, uh, getting in trouble in a magical school, lots of minis, which surprised me from this, with a very small board. Like it's, it, it's very condensed. Um, it comes with set factions, you can buy more, uh, which include other houses as well as character types like zombies and, and skeletons and stuff. Uh, there is a solo mode, what the game is actually about is you are in a library trying to collect tomes, magical tomes, that without getting caught by the teachers. So the way the game plays is you play a round before lunch where all your abilities are set and you're trying to grab these things while avoiding this, like, the, the, this teacher that walks around. Before lunch, the teacher's quick and, and alert. After lunch, the teacher's full and is plodding and slower. And after lunch, your characters unlock new abilities. Um, the, there, there's ways you get points, you level up your powers. It looks like a kind of mix of nuns on the run, ice cool without the flicking, but it has that theme and, um, Harry Potter Hogwarts, the, the house cup competition. You kind of mash up these all together. The thing that shocked me in this is I, I, sorry, there are three main people who do most of the shove and sit down videos, and I can't remember the second main one's name, noted, this is unlike anything we've ever played. That alone, I was like, whoa, like, like the, these are people who have been doing what I'm doing since 2011, have recorded thousands of videos. Man, they'd never seen this. It looks light and fun. The miniatures look cool. The only thing that turned me off was all those extra packs. This was very obviously a Kickstarter with lots of stretch goals, then locked more and more miniatures and powers. I got to admit, that turned me off because I didn't back the Kickstarter and go always all in. But this looks like a great alternative to a license you may no longer want to support. Indeed. There's... um. It looks like, so this is based off, and I'm still not actually sure if it's IV or four. Uh, I have actually <laughs> been doing research in the background and I'm still not sure. It's, it, they are a breakaway of a, uh, I'm going to call it Studio Four uh, animation studio in Nashville, okay. who some of the employees decided they wanted to do games, like board games as well. And they've been doing cool. uh, major commercial product work for, for ages. Um, this is their uh, fourth game, fourth or fifth game, I think. Okay. Um, so they're not, they're not brand new. Uh, they are a Kickstarter game. Oh, sorry. Eight. Uh, oh no, sorry. Uh, there's a whole bunch of expansions for me. Yeah, um, this seems to be their, their biggest Kickstarter to date by a long shot. Um, and they, they aren't, uh, chintzing out on the no. materials at all. Uh, in fact, a lot of people are kind of, um, non-North Americans are kind of terrified uh, we're, or we're terrified of shipping and backing and VAT because VAT wasn't included mm -hmm. in the price Ooh. and it was like, you know, 90 pounds, uh, you know, it, it, again, really nice, but you're paying for that. So mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's interesting. There's a lot of really nice components involved with mm -hmm. it, and uh, nice it, 3D I, bits. Yeah, and and the theme again. If you don't want to support that person and that uh, thing, this is a really solid option to do it. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if this even ever hits retail. Yeah, I don't know. So. I, I will admit, I the I, I watch demos. Demo looked cool. This one, this one, this one, I actually watched again an actual play, and they were having a lot of fun. Oh yeah. All right, well, uh, that's it for our list of games that we're excited about after learning about them at the Shut Up and Sit Down online convention, Aw Shucks, Autumn 2021. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome to a detailed look at Roll Camera, the cooperative movie-making board game. Thanks to Grand Gamers Guild for sending us a review copy of this game. Roll Camera, the filmmaking board game, was designed by Malaki Ray Rempin, and I apologize, that's probably Malachi, but I'm not certain. <laughs> probably Malachi. Malachi Ray Rampin, who also did the art and graphic design. Great job there, Malachi. Features a film reel-shaped insert that was designed by Bryce Cook. And thank you, Board Game Geek, for now listing things like who designed the inserts. Roll Camera was originally funded on Kickstarter and published in 2021 by a collaboration between Keen Bean Studios and Grand Gamers Build, at least here in North America. There are additional publishers for other parts of the world. Now, a second printing of the game is currently being filmed? Filmed? That's, we're talking about roll camera. That That's a Freudian slip that just fits, isn't it? Is currently being funded on Kickstarter along with a new B-movie expansion. No, we will not be talking about the expansion at all tonight. But there is no better time than right now, really, to hop on Kickstarter and check out this game when you can get all of the content in one mm -hmm. place. Yeah, and if I remember, it's cheaper than retail, too. It looks like a good deal. With Oh, they've added so much new stuff. But anyway. Role player plays one to six players. Note, despite what it says on Board Game Geek and the box. So I, this is something I'm hoping they're fixing with the center, second printing. The box and Board Game Geek both say it's a one to four player game, but then the rule book clearly has rules for playing with five and six. A game of roll camera tends to take about 45 minutes to about an hour and a half, depending on the player count. And of course, your experience and whether you're teaching the game or not. Now, Roll Camera is a cooperative board game where you take on the role of a production company brought in to save a failing movie. If you aren't able to complete this film on time, on budget, and at an acceptable quality level, you'll never work in the film industry again. The movie magic comes to life through a dice-driven worker placement game where you spend dice to build sets, hold production meetings, deal with and resolve an ending stream of problems, place actors and equipment on set, and film scenes, while trying the best you can to stick to the script. All too much like real-life productions where only careful planning and cooperation will get your movie across the finish line in a state anyone will want to see it in. Now, the original standard box printing of Roll Camera has an MSRP of $44 USD. Whereas the new printing is currently on Kickstarter has a $50 US pledge level. Now, this new second printing does feature the upgrades that were originally part of the Kickstarter edition of the original, including the UV coating, and they're very happy, they're proud of Clapper Box. Now, to see this Clapper Box and what you get inside it, be sure to check out our Roll Camera unboxing video on YouTube. Now, the production quality of this game is top notch. It features the highest quality set of rules I've ever touched. Like, I thought the ones in Tapestry were impressive. This actually blows them away. Sorry, Jamie. Board is thick and two-sided, though honestly, you only use one side to play. The other side is like a tool for storyboarding and telling your own stories. Uh, the dice are actually etched, so you don't have to worry about them wearing off. They actually feature symbols in two different colors. Cards are well-finished and feature clear designed iconography and very readable text. I honestly can't think of a single thing to complain about here. I wish more games were at this quality level. It's really nice to see a game publisher use Kickstarter to improve the game for everyone forever, not mm -hmm. just the backers once. Yes, I do love that. Stretch goals that improve the game for everyone. Great job there, Keen Bean. 
Now, setup for roll camera is pretty quick. You select or randomly assign one of the six rolls. You take the matching player board and summary card for that. Boards put it in the middle. You shuffle the tiles. The tiles are split in two and placed face up. These are your set tiles, four by four grids showing sets. Idea cards are shuffled and dealt to the players, three each or two each with four or six, or sorry, five or six players. The rest are placed next to the board. Problem cards are shuffled, put next to the board. Scene cards are shuffled and placed face up on the board with two scenes drawn. So you always have three face up scenes in the storyboard area. Five script cards from each deck, They're, these are split into two decks, top and bottom halves of your, of your script, are shuffled and placed face up on the board so you can only see the top one, and the quality token is placed on the start spot. Finally, you take money and time based on this little tracker with wheels on it. You actually flip it over and set the dials according to the number of players you have and the difficulty setting you want to play. Now, optionally, you can draw or select a production company card to use for this game. These add an extra level of difficulty to the game and include requirements like spending extra money to film, having a tighter time schedule, or having to finish at a certain quality level. Production companies are bad, but in a good way. They mm. up the difficulty of the game and are a great fine-tuning mechanism, either randomly or to work on something specific. Mm -hmm. and combined with the customization and time and money available, you can really fine-tune this game for something more or less intense. Now, each turn in roll camera starts with drawing a new problem. You read it out, you place it above the board. Then, act out on all the existing problems that are left over from previous rounds. Obviously, none the first round. Now, one slight benefit is if there's already three problems up, you don't have to draw a new one. You have plenty of deal to deal with at this time. You don't have to deal with a new one. And then you're going to roll all of the existing dice. Um... Sorry, I missed a step there, sorry. <laughs> These problems involve all kinds of things that make your life more difficult, including needing extra dice to film, not being able to use certain action spots, needing more money to do certain actions, and a ton more. This is a pretty thick deck. And then we get to the meat of the game, dice placement. Right. Now here, after resolving the current problems, you roll all the dice, you get to roll everything in the game except ones that are currently on set because you don't want to mess up with your, your, your already set up scenes. Note, before rolling, you can remove stuff from the set if you need to, but in most cases, they're going to be stuck there until you film the scene. You then place these dice onto various action spots on the main board or your player board. These actions include resolving those problems I mentioned earlier. The first problem to resolve is nice and simple, two dice. The next requires a pair. The next requires three of a kind. When you resolve problems, you flip them over and you get rewarded for solving problems in sets of five. For every five problems you solve, you either get $2, well, two of the money, two money, and, or add one week to your schedule. Trust me, you're going to need both. You can then add a set piece to the set or rearrange it. Again, there's a, a deck of these tiles that are four by four. You're going to choose one of the two top things and add it to your set. The set is a five by five grid. And you're going to try to set it up, hopefully in a way that you can later film one of the freeze face up scenes that are on the storyboard. And just to clarify, it's a five by five grid and the set, the set pieces are two by two, four yes. squares total, not four by four. You, <laughs> Thank you. Yes, two by two, four squares total. You're right. Um, so you're going to put this on and you're going to try to do it the, so that you're, you're matching the, the scenes on the storyboard. Hopefully more than one of them so you don't have to rearrange anything. Now, buying new scenes does always cost, whereas rearranging does not. Rearranging lets you move around everything is already on the board as long as you haven't assigned dice to them yet. Once you've got an actor on a set, they won't deal with you moving the stuff around. Them. Next, you can hold a meeting. This is, in, in my opinion, the best part of the game, the most fun part of the game, the most thematic, and the most cooperative part. Three players are selected to present one of their idea cards. One of these ideas will happen right then. Another gets placed on the to-do list, which is a spot on the board where it's saved for later, and a third is trashed. The idea deck is significant, and there are tons of things and ways to break the rules of the games, like gaining money or time or quality or taking actions at a reduced cost, resolving problems, using other players' special abilities, and so on. After having a meeting, everyone who submitted an idea gets to replenish their hand. A neat rule is when you're playing with more than three players, the person calling the meeting doesn't actually have to submit an idea themselves. 
Next up, there's a spot to hire interns. This is done to turn another die to any side of your choice, which can be useful for trying to get the right stuff on set or for using your special abilities. But hiring interns comes with problems. So as soon as you hire an intern, you must draw a new problem and act upon it. Now, filming a scene involves having dice on the set in a pattern that matches one of the face-up scene cards. Filming seeds cost money and can also have an impact on your quality and your schedule. Film scenes are then placed on the editing room track and a new scene is revealed on the storyboard, showing new ones. Another option is to complete the ideas on the to-do list. Remember earlier I said every time you hold a meeting, one of the, ide the ideas gets on the to-do list. The board has two spots for these that are saved that you can then enact on by either spending two dice or spending one die and paying a cost. Now, all of these actions are on the main board. In addition to this, every player role, and there are six of them, have three different actions on them that can, they can also use their dice on. Now, everyone has an action that lets him discard and draw new idea cards, but all the other actions are unique to the different roles. These include things like the star being able to change the script, the cinematographer able to use gaff tape to fix problems, or the director being able to reframe the scene and change the storyboards around, and more. Now, while it seems like there are a lot of options here, it's not actually that overwhelming as each time you get the dice, you probably won't be getting all six dice. And once mm -hmm. you've rolled, you'll be even further limited by what is face up on the dives themselves. Yes. Now at the each end of each player turn, your schedule gets reduced by one. And if time runs out, the entire team loses. Note, you can also lose instantly by running out of money. The inevitable tripod of production, time, quality, and money, pick any two. Now, if you don't run out of time or money, the game ends when your team films their fifth and final scene. You then look at the script that's up and compare that to the scene cards that are up and it has to do with the color thing. And you're looking at the color and the order of the scenes and you'll get some quality bonuses for fitting the script or lose quality for not fitting the script. The group as a whole wins if your overall film quality isn't in the red. Now, on the board, there are a total of five good quality winning ranks. But amusingly, you can also win if your quality drops to the absolute bottom of the quality track as you've made a movie that's so bad, it's good. Don't underestimate the power of a cult classic. You don't get the birds or killer tomatoes by making high quality cinema. Now, along with these pretty dry and simple mechanics, the game also encourages some role play while you're filming your movie. Every role has a player privilege on it that you can use during the game. These include things like the star being able to call for silence and the cinematographer being able to direct anyone who's taking pictures or videos while playing. Now, along with this, when you finish the game, the group is encouraged to tell the story of their movie using prompts on the board and the scenes that were used to finish the game. Finally, there is actually a whole other improv way to play the game by flipping the board over where you can play through an improv storytelling experience where you use the 20 scenes and place them through a five act structure and can tell a whole movie. Now, one final note, the game rules don't really change with player count. This is, is one of the only games I've ever seen where playing solo, the full rules apply. The only thing to watch for is some of the idea cards require multiple players. Those have a special symbol on them to identify these. And if you draw those while playing solo, you just discard them. That's it. Otherwise, you play it just like any other player count. Now, the other minor change I mentioned already is when you're playing five or six players, you only get two ideas and not three. All right. Well, now that we know how to play, let's move on to our thoughts about this cooperative dice placement game. So the first thing that caught my attention about World Camera is the team. I'm always looking for tabletop games that feature new or unique themes or less used themes. And honestly, this is the first non-role-playing game, tabletop game that I played about movie making. Yes, I know there are others out there, uh, the very popular Dream Factory and uh, the old cheap-ass game Deadwood Studios USA, but this was the first movie making game for me. And while there are others, this is not what I would consider a common theme. Yeah, so indeed, I was interested as one of my favorite games from growing up was a roll and move about making Oscar worthy films by combining actors and plots, uh, known as International Movie Maker, like we've talked about in the past. Yeah, we have. Now, the next thing that struck me about this was the component quality, uh, which I didn't know until I did our unboxing video. I admit, I didn't do a lot of research before this game showed up. And when I opened it up, I was surprised by just how well designed everything was. 
And then I was even more shocked with what Sean's already mentioned a couple times now is how little of what I got in this box that were Kickstarter exclusives. At first, I just assumed things like the real shape uh, plastic component or organizer from Game Trace was some kind of bonus, only to learn that's in every copy of the game. And that's pretty awesome. Now, with the new printing being kickstarted right now, even the stuff that was exclusive to my edition is in all future copies. They've decided this is the base level of this game at this point, which I think is awesome. And I would love to see more companies doing that. That just We put out a basic and deluxe edition. It's popular enough. We, we sold out our first print run. We're just going to go with the deluxe. Yeah, indeed. While I completely understand the idea that you're somehow losing out by not getting anything unique when you back on Kickstarter, mm -hmm. it's just not true. <laughs> this is a game that's more true to the intent of Kickstarter than many in this way. Yeah. Now, as for the mechanics and gameplay, they're just solid. Uh, I would go so far as to use the term elegant. Um, what I like most is the actions you take just make sense when compared to the theme, right? Like you're putting people on set, you're rearranging the set, you're ho having meetings. Now, there is still some abstractness, uh, like needing sets of the same dice to fix problems. Everything, though, just makes sense and it works. This is helped by the very simple but effective iconography used throughout the game like the symbol for dice is it's very clear the symbol for set and even the problem cards have a symbol on the back and kind of give you a heads up what might get affected the next turn indeed everything is quite obvious and familiar and while there is some reason required and certainly if you want to have fun with more in more than just just mechanically uh sorry there is some reading required and certainly if you want to have fun with it more than just mechanically. The icons really minimize it and make it easy to understand even for younger players or those less comfortable in English. Yeah, the hardest one would be the idea cards. You're probably just gonna miss out on the flavor text though. The iconography is pretty clear on them. Now, one great touch in this game that I haven't mentioned earlier as part of the review, and maybe I should have, but it wasn't part of how to play, is the humor that is included in this game. Along with mechanical things, uh, sorry, along with the game mechanics, Things like the problem and idea cards have hilarious flavor text on them. It really makes the game come alive, especially when you combine it with those player privilege abilities and people getting into characters. Now, that said, I realize that this aspect of the game isn't going to be for everyone, especially those player privilege rules where people can just call for silence in the middle of the table or start rearranging the area around the game board. Thankfully, those rules are optional and can be used by groups that like it and can be tossed aside for those that don't. And even if one player in the group is looking for more fun, they don't actively get in the way of others trying for a more serious game. And also, I was thinking about this earlier, if you can actually play this game with anyone who's worked in film production, they will enjoy the flavor text <laughs> with a whole other level of, on top of just the pure amusement anyone else would get from it. There you go. So one of the best parts about Roll Camera is the game balance. This is a cooperative game that feels tense at almost every moment. Maybe not your first turn, but by your second. You constantly have problems to deal with. You never have enough dice, and there's no way you're going to be able to complete your film without running out of time or money without clever use of the idea cards. Even in games where you win, it still feels like you could have lost at almost any moment. And that win always feels rewarding. With this, I do appreciate the various difficulty levels. So you can adjust your starting time and money based on the experience of the players. And then you can tweak that even further with the production company cards. So you can make the game even more difficult or even have a level that's kind of between easy and medium by playing easy with a production company. Yeah, and I haven't played with all the rules yet, but if there was any imbalance... I think at the lower player counts, making sure you have the right player roles could be that one tiny aspect that isn't in perfect balance, which of course is an issue with most asymmetrical games. But even with that, I know there are two ideas in the deck that let you swap out what roles are in play. So they've even taken account for that. Yeah. Now, even with all this great stuff going on in roll camera, there is one potentially serious problem that really does need to be brought up, and that is quarterbacking. This is a game where players need to work together to get their film created, and that is going to involve players suggesting to other players what they do on their turns. This includes simple things like, call a meeting, I've got a great idea, 
do having players get their hands in there and start moving around the set tiles on another player's turn just because they're trying to find the optimum position for all the current scenes that are up. With the level of cooperation required in roll camera, I think some quarterbacking is honestly inevitable. And that is going to turn some people off this game right from the start and make it a no starter. Now, this potential issue actually gets worse if you have experienced players playing with new players. Yeah, it might even be required for some tables to sort of enforce some level of quiet time so that the player whose turn it is has a chance to evaluate things for themselves before getting overwhelmed by suggestions. Mm -hmm. I would recommend this in particular for games with younger players. Yeah, if you've got a shy player, make sure they're still taking part. That, that is, was definitely an issue playing with my, my youngest daughter would speak quietly and just not even get heard. Make sure everyone is getting time at the table. Overall, Roll Camera is a very well-produced and well-designed cooperative board game with a theme you just don't see often. It's very well-balanced, providing tension from start to finish and offering variable difficulty systems to keep the game interesting as your group learns to play. The mechanics are easy to learn and well tied to the theme. Except for a potential quarterbacking problem, I have nothing else negative to say about this game. If you love working with other players to solve problems and competing against the game, trying to work together to win, you really need to check out Roll Camera. It is one of the most tense and rewarding cooperative games I've played. Due to the variable difficulty levels, it can be great for gamers of all experience levels and can even be enjoyed by younger kids. Things like the humor and role-playing aspects, to me, are just an added bonus, and if you don't like these aspects, are easy to ignore. Now, I personally haven't play had a chance to play this as much as I'd like, but it was so easy to pick up and get going with. It really does just flow smoothly, and I suspect would be a game many people would get back-to-back -back plays of when you do set it up on the table. Now, if you don't like group decisions and the possibility of players telling other players what to do in your cooperative games, you may want to steer clear of roll camera. Unless you're looking for a good single player dice placement game, because this game is great solo. It plays identical to playing with more players. This is definitely a game, though, that not only lends itself to quarterbacking, I would almost say encourages it. For the rest of you, not a huge cooperative game fan, but you don't mind some quarterbacking and you're willing to try it and you like dice placement or you like films, check this game out. Check out Roll Camera. It's a very enjoyable game. While I personally usually prefer competitive games, this is one cooperative game that has won me over. More impressively for longtime fans of the show, this one has managed to win over my wife, Deanna, who normally doesn't enjoy cooperative games at all. I think the theme here is going to appeal to a lot of gamers and may even be enough to get a non-gamer to sit down at the table and work with you to make a movie. Well, that's it for our review of Roll Camera, the filmmaking board game. I invite you to also check out Mo's written review of this expansion over on the oh. blog at Tabletop of this game over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now, the Bellhop's Table Talk, where we look back at games we played since last episode. All right, this week, I play games, lots of games, so many games. Uh, the most games I've gotten in since the pandemic started. I uh, started off with a game night with Tori and Kat, then a trip over to Dee's mom's with another gameplay, and then sat down with the kids and played some games. And then we sat down with Sean and played some games on Tabletop Simulator. And then we tried out a prototype. I, this was pretty awesome week for gaming. Well, and we're all glad to hear that you're feeling better and have had time to play again with a small lull in sales. Yeah, we thought there was one day we got up at like three in the morning expecting a big Funko sale and it was nothing. So I was a bit of a waste. So I, I think I've got these roughly in order. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to save the digital plays for last. So starting with physical plays, Friday night, we started off this cat and Tori are over. We started playing Yardmaster. So we just reviewed this two weeks ago. Yeah, I think two weeks ago. Um, so if you want more info on the game, you can check that out. This was Kat's request. She wanted to try this game because she knew she liked Yardmaster Express. And it's like, oh, I like Yardmaster Express. We've been thinking about buying that one. But then I shared pictures of Yardmaster. She's like, it doesn't look right. Why doesn't this look right to me? And I'm like, oh, that's Yardmaster. She's like, yeah, I played Yardmaster. You pass cards. I'm like, no, 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 that's Yardmaster Express. She's like, oh. 
so that was cool so i taught her to play yard master um she dug it um tori also dug it um as we talked about last week this is just a really solid thank you filler train game um the most amusing part though so we're sitting we play a game of yard master we start up a second game of yard master and we did something deanna joined us or something i think we played and then deanna joined and then my my phone went off because i had to go pick up food so tori and i left to go grab some sushi and while we were gone the girls sat down and started playing a game when we got back they were in the middle of the game well d grabbed the food off me and went to go plate it and grab utensils and everything else and was like take over for me so i sat down and then tori decided he had to take over for cat so let the men finish the game no tori's not a misogynistic asshole he was just making a joke uh, so we sat down and finished their game and I went on to totally destroy Tori in about three turns, ending up with my highest score ever in Yardmaster of 23 points, all for one train. I will say Tori scored absolutely no points in those three rounds and Cat was not at all impressed. That'll teach her, but at least you can play it again with them since Tori didn't win. That's true. Tori didn't kick butt in it, so he's no longer done. Deanna's actually pointing out, so they actually played two games. They're in the middle of their second game when we came back. Um, after that, we played a four-player game of Roll Camera, again with Tori and Kat. This was our first game trying out the production companies. Wow, production companies, ouch. Um, what was interesting about this is it changed the feel of the game, not just the difficulty. Uh, the one we drew, we had to end the game with our quality on the starting spot. No higher, no below. So you had to have it exactly there. And we had to have half or more of our budget left at the end of the game. To make things even more difficult, Tom was talking about picking roles to use. We didn't have a director. The director is the character that can convert money to quality to time and vice versa. We didn't have that. We still managed to win. It was close. It, it was within a turn. Now, the best part about that game, though, was the story we ended up telling while playing. All about a bunch of film students trying to make an art film with no director and how we were just losing it. And there were so many problems. And we were doing everything we could to completely avoid the script. Because, well, with that restriction, all the script cards give you bonus. All the script cards in this particular game gave us bonus quality. Well, we didn't want bonus quality. We wanted to stay right at the starting spot. So we were like, you cannot get any quality and you would be shocked how hard it is to try a film film scenes that don't apply to any of your script cards out especially when you get an event and then all of a sudden they change and now you have a different script that somehow now fits and you need to fix it it was very interesting game See that there's a real divergence from reality because i think many film students have no problem shooting com completely <laughs> off script for the whole movie <laughs> perhaps yeah i think it was like cheapscape studios i think is who we were playing it, it was definitely interesting now for our last game of the night with tori and cat i grabbed sentient off my pile of shame this is a very unique card drafting game featuring some awesome though repetitive artwork on tarot size cards um it's got a theme of bidding to be the company who will program a new line of sentient robots you do this by drafting robot cards from five different categories and placing them on your personal player board. Your player board has a set of dice on it and you place them between the dice. Now the card you place will actually affect the numbers on these dice, possibly making them roll up or roll down. And a one rolls to a six and a six rolls to a one. Now at the end of each turn, you're gonna have four robots in front of you. You're gonna score points based on what the dice say and the robots and every robot's got its own scoring thing. So one will say like, if the numbers are equal, score points, if one's greater than the other and so on. Now, at the end of the round, you're also going to attract investors through a bidding mechanic that was actually tied to the drafting system. So you're going to count your workers you put out while you were drafting, and whoever has the majority of workers around that investor will get the investor token. You get bonus points at the end of the game for having robots in your investors' companies, which kind of makes sense. And yeah, I know that sounds kind of confusing without seeing it, but it all works and makes perfect sense when it's in front of you. Now, all four of us, this was one of those games where you're playing, I'm teaching it, we're playing, and like, oh, that's neat. Oh, wait, that's cool. Oh, that's how that, wow. And then the, oh, this is good. And oh, this is really good. Oh, I like this. Okay, we have to play this more often. All those little comments that are just like, you can tell everyone's enjoying the game. What's weird about this is I don't remember any buzz about this game. Now, this is not a new game. This came out in 2017, and I don't, I hear anyone talking about it now and anyone talking about it then. And sadly, it is very out of print now. And I think that's a shame. This is a real hidden gem. 
And the perfect example of, wow, this is more complicated than it looks. This, this was definitely on the thinky side once you started to see how everything worked and how everything interacted. Yeah, I'm looking forward to trying this one myself when I get a chance. I have to add it to the Excel file or we'll forget. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, still Friday night, but just Deanna and I, we got another game off my pile of shame. That's two in one week. And that was Super Motherload. This is a game where there was a ton of hype that I got to say kind of vanished. No one seems to be talking about this game at all anymore. So I don't know what happened, why, why it's faded from the public consciousness lately. Now, when this came out, everyone was talking it dig dug the board game. And while I get the comparison, you are digging tunnels and dirt and you are getting some gems. It's not really all that dig dug like. Uh, for one, you're not killing monsters and there's no dropping things on things. And that was a big part of Dig Dug. And there's no like pumping things up there either. So what this actually is, is a deck builder that I think needs to go on the Sean list because it's a deck builder doing something new. Well, not that new because it's not the newest game. But again, anytime I see someone doing something new with deck building, I'm impressed. And I want to show it off to Sean Loves Deck Builders. The twist here is instead of buying from a central market that everyone's shopping from, everyone has their own set of cards to buy from. Now, you're using your cards to dig tunnels on Mars, where you place the tunnels are, are look like just blank spots. You place them on the board, and you get whatever you covered up. These gems you get, though, you put on top of one of four face-up decks in front of you. Now, each gem type has a different point value, and whenever the pile of gems on a card stack meets or beats the value of the card, you then acquire it, revealing the card underneath. So there's a neat thing where you choose which cards to pay for and you don't want to overpay for them and you can be, you know, paying towards multiple cards at once. All of this is rather different and interesting. Now, along with this, you can also set bombs. You can try to return achievements for collecting sets of cards or drilling through different material types, collecting gems, etc. At this point, we only played once. And mostly it was interesting. It was unique. It was, it, I, I wouldn't say it was, oh, this was a ton of fun, but it was just, it was neat to see deck building done different. Now, I do worry we played extreme, so the next time I play this, I'm going to see if uh, Rodney or someone has a video out there, or Paul Grogan has something out to watch, because the achievement deck is not small, and we went through all of them in a two-player game, and that just doesn't feel right, so I, I got to check the rules before we play again. Well, this certainly is a strange one, uh, but I'm going to withhold judgment until I, I try it myself, because there's, there's some intriguing aspects that could go either way. Now, this leads me to Sunday, where we tried roll camera with five players for the first time. This was at Brenda's, and all I really have to say about this is there's no reason to limit this game one to four. Like, I, I still, they need to fix that on Board Game Geek. I've already put in an edit, but it hasn't been accepted yet, and the box shouldn't say one to four. Sorry, apologize for that. Now, as mentioned in the review, the only actual change here is you get two cards instead of three. With the amount of interaction and everyone helping everyone else talking, I didn't see the usual, I'm waiting for my turn, because I'm active every turn. Now, fair, I do suspect trying it with nine players with the expansion <laughs> might just be insanity, though. At that point, I think you are going to get bored waiting for your turn. So you're just going to be like, can I, can I take part in a meeting, please? <laughs> I have something to, to contribute. All right, next up. These are games I play with the girls. So we um, sat down in kind of research for an upcoming episode because my daughter has gotten permission from her science teacher to bring in board. Well, actually, the whole class was given permission to bring in board games specifically on Wednesday. And I don't know why Wednesday is the day they can bring in games. So she asked me, she's like, what are a bunch of games I can bring to school? To, this is high school. Bring to high school that my friends will like and that fit my backpack. Now, her backpack is tight. Um, there is not a lot of room in there. So what I did to kind of prepare for this episode was I took both kids downstairs for about four hours and went through a bunch of games on my shelves that I thought would be good for her. So all the games I'm going to talk about here, we have talked about the show on the show before, either in weekend reviews or game recommendations or actual reviews. So I'm not going to give full detailed description of these, but I did want to give the list and kind of what her thoughts were on them. So first up was The Mind. I don't know if anyone remembers me talking about playing this with the kids before, but it did not go well, and it did not get better. The Mind just does not work for little G's central processing disorder. There's just something she does not grasp 
about this game. And it's not just recognizing the cards. It's the timing of when to play and reading other people and waiting to play and, and the judgment call of when to make a move. And it just didn't work. Um, I was hoping that she's a bit older now. She's now taking therapy for it. Things would have improved. Sadly, that's not the case. Though I now have a, a benchmark for judging if the therapy is helping. Because we'll try again in a couple months and see if she's gotten better. Now, this worked out fine because Gwen didn't think it would be a good game to bring to school anyway. Due to the complaint Deanna had about the game is this is not a party game because you can't talk. What kind of party game is it if you can't socialize and you can't chit chat? We were thinking this would be a great date night game because you're staring into each other's eyes. Yeah, but all you're doing is staring. So the mind, oh. Next, I grabbed the game. Um, I don't know if it's the same designer, but I know it's the same publisher. Very similar style of game. This went over much better, and the kids actually really enjoyed this cooperative card game. Um, the ability to talk and work together made this much more accessible for both kids and is now on the short list to bring to school. Next, I grabbed Breakdancing Meeples. Uh, this was a huge hit for the kids, especially my youngest loved this. Though as for bringing it to school, the tin is a bonus. Like, yeah, tin fits in the backpack, won't get damaged. But the timer requirement and possibly using the app because it keeps track of your score, otherwise needing a score sheet and the loud nature of the game were minuses. So this one's a, we're going to have a couple game nights and decide if it seems like an appropriate game for the setting because they haven't done it yet. Yeah, unfortunately, loud, boisterous games that might disturb other students can be problematic, even more so in high school than in grade school where yeah. they can, you know, that's a little <laughs> more acceptable. Always. Yeah. Next up, I grabbed it because Genevieve thought the art looked cool. I grabbed my copy of Skull. I did not expect this to go over well, but both my kids loved it. They thought it was really fascinated. Um, my youngest, Genevieve, loved it. She, it, it seems she's starting to really dig bluffing games. So some, there's somewhere we diverge. Like As far as food and other stuff, me and Jen are gen, generally together, and Gwen takes over her mom. But I don't know. If she's, I, I think we might have, like, I think Jen would actually like Werewolf. I don't know. As for bringing this to school, this one ended up being a maybe. Um, I probably shouldn't have told the kids that this started as like a biker drinking game. For some reason, that just turned her off on it, even though that really has nothing to do with the game now. It's just the roots of the game. But I think she was kind of like, well, I don't want to bring a drinking game to school. So it seems like your kids didn't inherit your dislike for the bluff. No. Uh, that's something you better watch out for. Eh? <laughs> oh, it's already a problem. Trust me. <laughs> uh, next, I get, grabbed a game I don't personally love. Um, we've talked about it on the show before. I know Shad's a fan, but I'm just, I don't know. I take it or leave it. And that is Hanabi. Again, I was surprised how much the kids liked it. We managed to finish off a game with a pretty good score. We had three stacks to five. Uh, the one of them was still only at one, but still three stacks to five is solid game of Hanabi. And both kids were like, can we play this again later? Like, can we put this on the shelf to play? But as for school, it was a no-go. Gwen was convinced there is no way these uh, um, non-gamers will get the concept of not looking at their cards because you hold Hanabi this way. I'm like, they're high school kids. They're going to get it. Like, yeah, but none of them understand games, Dad. And I have to keep warning her on her uh, her her, her uh, gatekeeping this of the the yep. just because you play games certain games does not make you better than other people. So we had we had to have that short talk again. So she was concerned that people and I gotta admit it is a weird concept. Like if if you're not used to it, not looking at your cards is weird. But fair enough. She didn't want to bring it. She doesn't want to bring it. Now it's a shame because that is such a fun game. Even though I've never actually won a game of it. Uh, because again on BGG there is no oh we did yeah, pretty well it's win or lose. Yeah, I, I honestly don't see how you can play that one on BGG and actually. Finally, as for playing with the kids, we wrapped up with Rumble in the Dungeon, which was the biggest hit of the day. My kids adored this silly, super simple I, dungeon battle brawler, whatever it is. Um, they each have their favorite characters. Um, we played three rounds of the game. Together, then the kids couldn't wait to finish so they could bring it upstairs and make up their own rules and their own variants they played up in the room for over an hour making up their own variants and rules and i was sitting down here and trust me they were having fun 
Um, variants I learned about that I thought actually sounded pretty good include assign every character. So everyone, someone. Uh, another that I liked was you don't get to look at your characters until the first kill, which adds a random element of you might have lost one of your characters the first turn. Um, the other one I really liked, and this is one I actually want to try, is scoring both your characters at the end of the round. So if you manage to get knocked out like third and fifth, you may do better than the person that gets knocked out first and last, which I think could actually add an interesting level to that game. Yeah, I have to say, I've only played this one once when we were waiting for one of the parties or another to get started mm -hmm. and not many people had arrived yet, but it was a fun game. So what else is funny is I have a Tom Vassal expansion for this. So I have a Tom Vassal standee in Tom's game room. They were obsessed with having Tom in the game. They had to have Tom in the game. And it was all who kills Tom or who does Tom kill. That was a big one. Right. And uh, Gwen is a huge gelatinous cube fan, all which right. they call the blob. I still like to call it the cheese, but she called it the blob. <laughs> so jumping over to digital games, and this isn't Board Game Arena. These are like sit down, real time playing. These I you know rank on Board Game Geek. Um, we started off with a game of roll camera so Sean could actually play the game before our review today. Now, Sean had previously read the instructions, so we kind of knew what was going on. Um, it went really well. That game is easy to teach, and I think we've now found a game better scripted than Space Base. Yeah, it was uh, it was really well done on, on Tabletop Simulator. And, I mean, yes, I had read the instructions, but I'd never actually gotten all the components out and set them mm -hmm. up. Uh, so I was familiar with the concept, but again, we were in, taught, played, and done in 48 minutes or something like yeah. that. <laughs> Sounds about right. So, yeah. It can be a nice, quick game. Now, I will admit, trying to put pieces on the set pieces was a little annoying, but I think that's a tabletop simulator limitation because everything else was so well Yeah, scripted. I think, unfortunately, the layered interlocking things is, is probably just a game uh, then the final game this is so new hotness no one's heard of it we are total internet board game hipsters here we played the hot abstract strategy game arachnid where you are playing a swarm of up to four spiders trying to build the biggest web eating bugs and dealing with inclement weather that can destroy your webs if it's not reinforced. This was on Tabletop Simulator and by local game designer, Roger Dodger. And if you think this sounds cool at all, we can easily hook you up with Roger and he will teach you his game. Absolutely. If you are a fan of spiders uh, or of, you know, sort of the, this, this kind of uh, game that could be uh, anything else, uh, definitely worth giving a try. It's still in development. Uh, and uh, Roger is certainly looking for more players, I believe, to uh, introduce to and get a, get find, uh, find the bugs in the uh, Arachnid game. So some of the highlights, why you might want to check this one out, is um, the ability to hire characters with different powers. But you, you each start, well, we each started with a unique one, which I, I swear should be a rule, but then you can buy the other types once the game started. I thought that was neat. And then a really interesting action mechanic that was card driven, where you have three slots at the bottom of your board, and you're going to slot in an action. And then you can choose through the action or wait until it slides over to the next spot or the next spot. And some of the actions did the same thing in all three spots. Others got better. Others got more expensive this slid along. And you had to choose which ones to do. So you're like, you could put spin a web in your first spot and use it the first turn, but to use spin a web in your second slot would cost you more. And the third slot would cost you even more. Meanwhile, reinforce was actually, or sorry, what was a jump actually got eaten? No, jump got more expensive. What was one of the ones um, eating? I can't remember. Harvest? Foraging. Forage. Forage. Foraging, you got to forage the bugs next to you stuck in your web. The next one was you could move them forage. And the last one was move, forage, move. And then you could buy new actions. And it was just an interesting combination of um, action selection with the actions changing the longer you're on your track. 
And even a mechanic where you could not take the actions and they'd stay there, though I didn't personally play with that one. I think that was the neatest part of the game. The theme was cool. The abstract nature, like I could totally see that being a physical game with flipping the tiles over. Um, it did seem like it wasn't perfect, I will admit. There are definitely some things to fix. There were definitely some questions that came up, but it's in playtesting. What do you expect? Yep. So if you're interested in checking out Arachnid, just hit me up. Um, if Roger wants to throw his email address in the chat, we can do that. But the best way is probably just email me, Mo at Tabletop Bellhop, or hit me up on social media, and I will put you in contact with Roger, and he will be happy to show you Arachnid, which I, out of all his games I played so far, this was definitely the most interesting and intriguing. All right. Well, now how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Okay, so the big thing I need to do, because Sean keeps poking me every day, saying, I have no unboxing videos to release on Monday. Well, I haven't seen that package from Check Games Edition yet. I have to assume it got caught in a meteor swarm or got attacked by space pirates. So regardless of whether it shows up or not, I'm going to report some unboxing videos this weekend. What I'm probably going to do is Friday, Tori and Kat are at a wedding, so we're not having our weekly game night this Friday. So I'll probably do some unboxing videos on Friday. And... Hopefully that'll include the new edition of um, Galaxy Trucker. And if not, I don't know, I'll grab some stuff off the, the, the pile of shame or something. I do need to unbox Land versus Sea, though. So that is the game I want to play the most. So once I'm done recording, I want to play Land versus Sea. This is the latest game from Good Games Publishing. Have not played a bad game for them. Based on what I'm seeing from other reviewers, I don't think this will be their first bad game. I think it's just going to continue the chain of great games. Um, the other thing I think we need to do that we haven't done in a long time, and I'm probably going to get Deanna to cheer here, is I think it's time we sit down and actually start playing Adventuria again. We've kind of got distracted from playing other stuff, and we have a ton of Adventuria content to go through. So maybe, there we go, there's the cheering. Um, we'll combine that maybe with the unboxings. So one of the things I'll unbox is figure out what we want to play next after Forest of No Return. So maybe this weekend we'll finally go through Forest of No Return, and then the week after we can start working on something else. Other than that, I would love to get some stuff off the pile of shame. It's been nice being able to reduce my pile of shame and play games that aren't actually, you know, obligations. I don't need to email anyone back. I don't have to have the perfect pictures. I don't have to worry about getting a review done. I can just sit down, play, and put it back on the shelf. That's been a pleasant uh, experience recently, and it'd be nice to keep knocking that pile down. Now, before I do move on, if you do want to get in contact with Roger, and I was pretty sure this is what it was, it's rogerdodgergames at gmail.com. Or hit up rogerdodgergames.com. Yeah, rogerdodgergames.com, R-O-G-E-R, no D, R-O-G-E-R, D-O-G-E-R, games, G-A-M-E-S, all one word, dot com, or at gmail.com. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers whose support we always appreciate. John P. Kelly of the excellent Gaming and BS podcast. Andrew Dacey. Thank you, Andrew. Brian Van Beek. Thanks for being active on our Discord. Diane Susano. Thanks, Ma. The Misdirected Mark podcast, recording live here on Twitch Tuesday nights. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shifts are coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing, would like to support our continued efforts and help offset a huge van repair bill, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. And before we go, one more quick shout out to our sponsor, Crowd Games. Check out City of the Great Machine on Kickstarter, already funded right now. And if you're not interested in Patreon, don't forget there is always coffee you can... Uh... Donate a copy or a cappuccino at co.fee slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. And stop by Sundays for brunch now over on YouTube. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.